Good day. My name is Bryce Reeve, and I am a professor at Duke University School of Medicine, and here I serve as director for the Center for Health Measurement. And what I'll be talking to you in my short amount of time is providing sort of a, a overview of the landscape for clinical outcome assessments for assessing pain. And I will define what clinical outcome assessments are in a moment. So there are a broad range of uh, ways or tools we use to assess pain and related constructs. And two main types of measures either come from biomarkers, um, for example, uh, looking at saliva or, or blood. Um, and you can learn more about biomarkers uh, from Dr. Uh, Petra Sh uh, Schreinhart uh, in another presentation in this particular series. And the other way we, other tools we use to assess pain are what we call clinical outcome assessments. And this will be a focus for my presentation. So there are lots of tools that fall under the umbrella or are within the toolbox of clinical outcome assessments. And basically the differences among these tools depend on where is the source of information we're collecting to evaluate or assess a person's pain level. The ideal or what is considered the gold standard is that each individual person or patient should be able to report on what her or his pain level and pain experiences are. And so here we're looking at an example from the PROMISE uh, system, which is their 11 point numeric rating scale, which asks in the past seven days, how would you rate your pain on average? And you can see a score of zero represents no pain and a score of 10 represents worse imaginable pain. So again, patient report outcomes are the ideal type of way that we would collect any type of information about pain. If you want to learn a lot more details about patient report outcome measures, I encourage you to watch the video from Dr. Robert Edwards from Harvard, who will go in much more in depth than I will about PRO measures. Now, when the person can't self-report, and it could be because they're too young, too ill, or just don't want to provide that information, we then have to rely on other sources of information to inform our evaluation of pain. And so the next group of tools I'd like to talk about are clinician report measures, and these are clinicians, whether it's physicians, nurses, or uh, physicians assistants, um, um, that would be um, filling out a questionnaire to evaluate a patient's pain. And so what you're looking at on the screen for very young children, infants, um, is what's considered the flax scale, the faces, legs, activity, cry, solubility scale. And you can see within this scale, um, they have the clinician look at different behaviors, pain expressions, whether it's the child's face, legs, activity, cry, and solubility. And then you can see the clinician can score for each criteria, a uh, score of zero, one, two, to represent different levels or severity of pain. Uh, if, not from, if the information is not from clinicians, then we might uh, ask the parents or a caregiver to report on the patient's pain levels. And so those are, are coined observer reported outcome measures. And so uh, the point being is that there is an external person that's observing the person or patient's pain levels. And so here's an example of the parent's post-operative pain measure. And you can see there's a series of yes, no questions like, you know, does the child whine or complain more than usual, cry more easily than, than usual, play less than usual, et cetera. Now, typically the next set of performance outcome measures aren't typically for evaluating pain, but might be relating, but might be used to measure constructs related to pain. So if a person's severing, uh, excuse me, experiencing a lot of pain, that might impact their type of performance, whether it's like a walking distance or grip strength or things like that. So, um, so for performance outcome measures, these are typically done by the patient um, under the observation of a assistant or, or a staff member. And so in this particular six minute walking distance test, we're seeing how far this particular woman can walk within six minutes. Um, and again, you would, it, the expectation is people that experience a lot of pain will have more limited distance than someone without pain. There's another interesting category for which uh, many are thinking about whether this fits within the toolbox of clinical outcome assessments or as a biomarker, and in fact, there actually could be potential for digital measures fitting in both areas. 
Um, now, if the digital measure was something like blood pressure or heart rate, that might be a biomarker. But if we're using a digital measure to assess activity, um, that might fall under the, the umbrella of a clinical outcome assessment. And again, the thinking there is um, a person might be less active if they're experiencing severe levels of pain. Now, the important thing to note, whether the information about pain is coming from a biomarker or from a clinical outcome assessment, is they all have some level of error associated with them. There is no perfect assessment of pain, um, regardless of the source or the type of source. Um, one of the quotes I really like is from a, a German um, physicist, Dr. Werner Heisenberg, who said, what we observe in nature itself uh, in itself, but not nature exposed to our method of questioning. And so um, the point what I love about this quote here is it sort of reminds us is that we're applying a set of tools uh, to try to capture this pain experience. And again, all these tools have some type of error. And so our goal as methodologists and researchers is try to reduce the error or noise around those pain assessments. So as we think about um, uh, pain, what I'd like to think about in terms of, of, of thinking of a framework of how we think about assessing pain, I'd like to think, I'd like to think about pain in, 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 the, in the framework of thinking about the lifespan. And the lifespan, if you think about it, because we're interested in research, whether we're interested in very young babies or trying to identify what would be appropriate sort of therapeutic or intervention to reduce acute pain in babies and infants, all the way up to looking at research of, of pain in older and adults and older adults. And so for us and for people like me who spend their whole career thinking about how we measure these types of constructs, um, it's important that we take the lifespan in consideration, both in terms of the outcomes we want to measure, and you'll see at the top here, uh, above my lifespan, I've, I've included several pain constructs, such as pain intensity, um, pain frequency, or how much uh, interference is, uh, in the person's life uh, the pain is, is impacting. And then below this framework um, are the set of clinical outcome assessments or tools we use to assess pain. So with this sort of framework, I think this is a nice way for me to think about how we both to think about the concept we're measuring and the way we measure it across our lifespan. So let's take, for example, look above our continuum, our lifespan, and just take the construct of pain interference. And so we can ask a lot of important questions when considering the lifespan as a framework. One question might be is actually, how do we actually define a construct like pain interference? Um, and there could be variable answers. Um, it could be, well, you know, how does pain interfere with a specific type of movement? Like, you know, does a person's, uh, um, jaw hurts so much they don't want to talk or eat food or does the pain interfere with a person's ability like arthritis of, uh, interfere with a person's ability to grip or we might think of inner pain interference in a much more global or broader sense um, like how does pain interfere with a person's ability to um, to take care of themselves or to go to work or go to school um, or to socialize so um, depending how we define it it sort of depends a little bit on the type of research questions we may ask in addition to that, we might actually ask is how we de define in, in pain interference, does it vary depending on the lifespan? And my answer would probably be yes. And so how we define pain interference might differ. So if we're talking about a, a, a toddler or child, you know, interference might relate to that child's ability to go play a friend or go pay attention in school. Um, if we're talking about an adult, um, we might think about pain in terms of interference with being able to, uh, uh, to can do their work, whether they work full-time, part-time, or not work at all. So again, we have to take that lifetime consideration and recognize that depending on where this person is in their lifetime, uh, um, the way we define a thing like pain interference might vary. We might also wonder because, you know, we're interested because a lot of times we're doing longitudinal research and looking across a lifespan, is are there any essential features or core features of pain interference that are consistent across the lifespan that would allow us to do longitudinal or prospective work? And the extent there are core features allows us to make those comparisons or to follow a person over a lifetime. And so you can see there are some core features perhaps among adults, but you can't assume that 
measuring pain interference in a toddler or baby is the same concept as pain interference in an adult or older adult. So you might not be able to make those same comparisons across the lifespan. And then lastly, we might ask, um, how does our definition of pain interference might vary or change based on the condition or disease? And um, uh, as, as a specific example, you know, the way we define uh, like acute pain interference might be different from a chronic pain and pain interference. Um, or a person with a severe uh, a cognitive deficit or developmental deficit, again, we might think differently about the way we define pain. Now let's look below our lifespan continuum and look at the types of clinical assessment tools. And again, if you remember, the different tools we have vary based on where the source of information is coming from, whether it's self-report, like a patient report outcome, or from observer or clinician. And with the tools, we can ask similar types of questions. For example, which measurement tool, which clinical outcome assessment is more or less appropriate at different parts of our lifespan? And so again, if we think of the patient report outcome as the gold standard, um, unfortunately we can't administer a self-report to a baby or toddler. And so typically we start using patient report outcome measures when a child maybe for pain could be um, maybe at as young as four or five, but uh, we feel a little bit more confident when that child is maybe seven or eight years or older. When it were below the age of maybe four or five or less than seven years, uh, we then depend on sort of other sources of information, such as a clinician or a parent. Or at the opposite end of our extreme, um, in the older adult, perhaps a, a patient with dementia may not be able to self-report. And again, we have to think of how to use other sources like an observer or caregiver to provide that information. We can also ask questions like, well, if there are times when we actually get multiple sources, can we combine them and develop a composite measure of pain? So for example, if this is a young baby, um, we might have a clinician provide information using the FLAC and a parent providing information using a, a different caregiver tool. Um, should we look at those two tools separately or is there a way to combine them because each source of information might be able to provide different types of information about that person or child's pain levels. In addition, we need to consider is how does our measurement approach might vary depending on the person's condition, disease, or setting. Again, in the example that someone with who has a, a cognitive deficit and can't self-report um, how does our measurement probe might change to be able to capture that person's pain level and not have that missing data? So hopefully you'll find this framework, this lifespan framework, an, uh, uh, an interesting uh, opportunity for a broader discussion, both about the concept, what it means and how it varies across the lifespan, as well as a set of tools we want to apply to assessing pain and its impact on people's lives. Which gets us to the next point is, um, you know, we, what we need to recognize, especially in the field of pain, there are a lot of good existing pain measures out there. Um, and so um, do we ever need to develop new measures? Um, so uh, Dr. Kanisha Zimmerman, a good friend and colleague of mine, and I, uh, when putting together a grant application, actually looked at pediatric uh, pain research for acute pain. Um, and we went to clinicaltrials.gov and took a look at the existing measures of pain um, used in pediatric populations. And what you'll see in the first column is the trial we pulled the data from. Um, the second column is the age of the, of the children that were included. The third column is the intervention under study. The fourth column is how pain was used as a primary secondary outcome. And in the last column is the measure they used. And we can see just even as pediatric population, there's a broad range of tools that are used and there's no consistent measure. And so we see such tools as the visual analog scale, the VAS, the numeric rating scale, the NRS. I talked about the FLAC earlier. And there's the faces and pains uh, rating scale as well. So again, even in the pediatric populations of the narrow age range, we do see quite a number of existing measures used. And so the question is, do these existing scales need any type of refinement or are, are we good to go um, with, with research? And again, there's been a long history of using these particular measures. And so let's just grab a few too and just think about whether we need any additional refinement. So 
Here's a question I presented earlier. It's asked, in the past seven days, how would you rate your pain on average? And zero represents no pain, and 10 represents worse manageable pain. So as a measurement development person myself, you know, I have to think about carefully about how this numeric range scale is, uh, is answered by different types of patients. So there are two things at least that stand out to me about this particular measure. One is the anchor of worse manageable pain. Now, I can imagine for every single, if I ask every single one of you out there, what is your worst imaginable pain? I imagine if there are 10 people watching my video, I'll get 10 different answers of what worse imaginable pain is. And that heterogeneity has to have an impact on the range and type, uh, on the range of pain experiences and intensity and how people use those upper categories of eight, nine, and 10. And the extent there's heterogeneity in how people express or think about worse mental pain will have an impact on the way they answer that particular question. Another thing we have to think about is the reference period. Um, is past seven days, should we use one week? Well, that might, for chronic pain, that might be appropriate, but for acute pain, it might vary within a day or across days. So how does a person answer that question? Another scale um, is the, uh, the FACES pain rating scale. Um, and this is typically developed for young kids who can't read. And so these faces are supposed to help out for them to be able to judge which face to answer to represent their level of pain. Now, again, just, you know, looking at this as a developer, uh, when I look at the faces, um, you know, I wonder, does, does those faces actually represent pain levels or would a child think of those faces to represent sadness instead of pain? Um, if you look at no hurt at the very bottom left, is, is it necessary that a child without pain should be very happy? I don't know. Um, or a, pain, a child with severe pain will be crying? I don't know overall. And so another thing you could look at is the numbers. You know, why, why is the happy zero and where did one go? Uh, then there's two, four, six, eight, ten. So why are we skipping that? And for children, they might not understand why numbers are being skipped in that continuum. So again, we have to ask why, why do it have to be this way? So are there ways we can take really good existing skills like these and actually improve upon them? And so that leads me to my last and sort of summary slide uh, for today. And just uh, what I want to note is that our field of how we assess pain continues to advance and move forward in a number of different ways. And so as I alluded to in the previous slide is I think there are continual opportunities for us to rethink the way we ask our questions about pain and provide maybe more valid and more appropriate response categories for different types of our population, whether it be younger or older, sicker or non-sicker, whether acute pain or chronic pain. Also, you'll see there's initiatives, especially sponsored by the FDA, to move towards having a more core set of both clinical outcome assessment, assessments and the endpoints that are used to evaluate whether a drug is effective or not. Um, as I showed you for the pediatric case, there's a wide range of assessments that are being used. And can we move towards having a more core centralized set of tools? Therefore, we are, have the ability to compare results across multiple studies or trials. Third, um, we're starting to think about how to use digital technology to get more frequent pain assessment. And one example is ecological momentary assessment research, where a person or patient might actually have their smartphone or a watch with them at all times. And throughout the day and throughout the week, this watch or this app on a phone can ping the patient and we can get more frequent assessments of pain to be able us to be able to see the trajectory of pain within a day and across days. Um, we also need to think carefully how to use all these different tools together or independently to assess pain related constructs and get a much more broader and comprehensive evaluation of pain and how it impacts patient lives. And then my last point and where I'll stop here um, is we need to make sure as we're evolving our ways we define pain and measure pain, we need to make sure we include multiple stakeholders. Now the most important stakeholder are actually patient and patient advocates because they should be one to help us think about again, how we define what this pain construct is, what's the components of pain and what we should be determining as how to measure in a trial, and then also what represents meaningful change from the patient perspective.
So with that, I thank you for your time and look forward to our uh, subsequent discussions.